Great. So first of all, uh, another acknowledgement that we are on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories right now here in Vancouver of the um, Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. And so thank you for that. Um, I am a relative newcomer to Creative Mornings. I didn't even know what Creative Mornings was until about a month ago when uh, actually Mark and Ian invited me to come on and, uh, and do some weird modular synthesizer stuff. I was like the musical guest last month. And so another big thank you to the Creative Mornings uh, team because this is, this is a new community for me. And uh, it's really cool. You know, usually I don't like think about getting up first thing in the morning and giving a talk or listening to other people talk. It's usually like a time to chill out and, you know, have a cup of coffee. But I really do appreciate this, uh, this gesture. And uh, today's talk, I was given the theme of underdog. And, uh, you know, Mark, when he asked me last month whether I'd want to do this talk on underdog this month, I was like, yeah, sure, I can, I can relate to being an underdog. Like, there's, there's definitely, like, times in my life. And, you know, I think a lot of what I do is sort of advocacy for the underdog. So I think I can get into this. Uh, the more I, I kind of dove down this rabbit hole of underdog, the less I liked it. And so I'm going to get into a little bit of that later. Um, but this is Creative Mornings. And so, you know, the other, the other message that I have for you this morning is creativity is, you know, I have bowed down to creativity, the creative force. I've sort of, uh, I, am, I am an advocate and an evangelist for creativity. And I'm also an advocate, an advocate for, um, for putting purpose behind that creativity. Um, so I'm going to talk about those two things and how they played out in my life. And I think what would probably help to start with is... Who am I? Actually, you know what I'm going to start with? I was in tears about 10 minutes ago listening to Desiree. So, wow. I mean, we have not, like, had this experience. Like, it's so rare to be able to be creative, to, to witness other people's creativity these days. And I just have so much appreciation. I, I had to go to the bathroom because I was literally weeping. And so, thank you. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> So beautiful to listen to live music. So lucky, you know, all these little things that we took for granted. So I grew up in Montreal. I was the son of an immigrant dad from, from South Asia. He was Punjabi, Hindu Punjabi, and, uh, and a white mom from New Brunswick, who I believe is on the call. And I think this is her first uh, Creative Mornings ever. So hi, mom. Um, and I think my dad will probably watch the recording later. So hi, dad. Uh, they, they actually met in Vancouver at UBC and moved out to Montreal to, to raise a family. In Montreal in the 80s, uh, was an extremely dynamic place. There was French being spoken, English being spoken. I mean, it's still like that. Uh, and I was raised mostly by my paternal grandparents, so my Indian grandparents. So there was Hindi spoken at home, um, a real mix of stuff. And at that point in time, I was the only biracial person that I knew besides my sisters. Uh, I don't even think biracial was a term back then. Uh, it was, it was, I would say, extremely confusing because there were so many languages, and I was also sort of split in some ways. I was too white to be brown, but too brown to be white, and so I really didn't know where I fit in. And I think that that is sort of the beginning of this underdog thinking inside of myself. Um, you know, like where in the world, Desiree was talking earlier about you know, seeing a reflection of yourself. I just didn't see anybody who looked like me doing anything. You know, I looked around at my friends. I looked around, you know, on TV, on the radio. I didn't have that coming back to me. So I was, I was definitely lost, definitely confused. And it didn't make matters easier that my parents, um, God bless them, uh, had me start learning Indian classical music from the age of seven. So that was really my introduction. And uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's been such a huge influence in my life. Uh, and at the same time, there were very few kids who I knew who were like, you know, 15 years old and listening to Ravi Shankar of their own volition while being obsessed with like Michael Jordan. You know, I didn't find a lot of kids in the, in the community who shared this kind of passion. Um, and so I think that's where music came in. Music for me was a way of making sense. And tapping, you know, as I grew older, tapping into music as my sort of creative outlet was really what allowed me to tap eventually into my heart and opened up the rest of my life. Now, pursuing music, as Amr probably knows, if you have South Asian parents, that is not a viable career option. 
That's like, that's like, nah. So when I told my dad, uh, going into college, that I was going to go into liberal arts, he was like, okay, well, you're also going to get kicked out of the house. <laughs> so dad, thank you. You know, I appreciate all the advice, and I know that you're probably going to watch this. Uh, so I was like, okay, you know, I didn't have any backbone at that point. I was like, okay, I guess I'm going into science. And, and he was like, yes, that's acceptable. So I went into science, did the science thing. But on the side, I was always, you know, playing in bands and, and expressing myself through music. And that really came to a head. Um, you know, things really opened up for me in the music realm when I went to university. And I actually came to UBC from Montreal to do uh, my first year of university when I was, I think I just turned 18 or 19. Um, and then I discovered psychedelic drugs. And that's really, I mean, let's just be honest here, right? It's, it's the morning, and so we can just be honest. Um, that's really what helped me understand what I had been doing for the last 12 years of practicing music. Uh, and I, I, it's akin to, let's say, a fighter, let's say a martial artist or something, where you're just kind of relegated to like, I'm not a martial artist, so I'm going to look ridiculous here, but you're kind of relegated to like all of the drills you're doing and stuff, but you've never sparred. And so I'd been practicing an instrument and training and training and training uh, for 12 years. And all of a sudden, one night in the Totem Park residences of UBC, which is not too far from where we're standing right here, uh, I, a friend, you know, I'd just taken my first dose of mushrooms ever. And a friend was like, well, let's play music. You have drums. And I was like, sure, yeah, I have drums. You know, I can play music. And so we started playing and all of a sudden magic happened. And I think that anyone who's a creative person knows that feeling when you get into the zone and you can tap into all of the training that you've done and improvise in the moment, um, get light and get free and everything sort of, all of this, this wave of experience sort of is able to express itself and crash onto a shore as it were. And that's what happened. I, I was, I was, in the moment, improvising musically with this instrument that I've been studying since I was a kid. And that experience is really what kind of opened up, um, opened up my musical path because it showed me that I had something to play with. Um, so that experience led to me being in more bands, which led to me doing more drugs, which led to me getting really into electronic music, uh, which led to me learning how to DJ, which led to me um, throwing parties in my basement in Kitsilano, um, which led to me eventually starting to promote shows in clubs, which eventually has led me to the point where, you know, through so many, like the, my 20s, for any of you who are in your 20s who have kids in, in your 20s, it was such a confusing time of trying to figure out what the I was and what I was doing. You know, it was, it's not like it was a smooth transition, but I think that whole process really allowed me to tap into, I figured out where my creative passion was. Um, I figured out the thing. I, I figured out it was music, but the missing ingredient was still how do you turn that on and off at will? How do I put purpose behind the creativity? Um, and I didn't know that was a problem at the time, but looking back on it in hindsight, I think that that was really what I was grappling with. You know, I think a lot of us musicians, and maybe Desiree, you can relate, we're sort of at this place where like, we're waiting to be swept up with inspiration. And I think what I've learned is that there are also certain practices that we can do um, that make that easier, that make it easier to turn and off, and off at will. And for me, that was a daily practice. And uh, so again, rewinding to my childhood, my grandmother, on my Indian side was a devout Hindu, and she was really my kind of initiation into spiritual life. So as a kid, I used to watch her, you know, she would listen to the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, these ancient Indian epics, like at night and in the morning, and I would hear these sounds and music and pujas that were happening at home. Uh, and my, my tabla teacher, my guru, who I took on when I was seven, he would also feed me information, you know, sort of spiritual information. And I think all of that stuff over time went from being kind of a fantastical world of gods and goddesses to being kind of more of an intellectual fascination to eventually, when I was in my mid-20s, eventually settling into an actual practice. And so my practice that I do has, has, has gone through many different transitions and I've explored so many different avenues. Uh, and it's really been a wonderful, um, you know, a wonderful journey over the last, I think I've had a daily practice now for almost 15 years. 
And at one point in time, it was like an hour and a half every morning of reciting mantras and doing prayers and stuff. And then it's gone through a sort of Buddhist zone. And now I'm really into breath work. So, you know, props, Summer. I think uh, working with the breath is just so powerful. Um, and so rather than keeping on talking about it, I thought that I'm gonna follow from Amr's lead and we're gonna do a little exercise together. So I'm on my feet. You guys down for this? I know that we can't see each other, but I'm guessing that you're creative people and you're down. And for all of the folks in the room right now, uh, let's do this. You can, you can put down the phone and let's do this together. It makes a difference if we all do it together. So everyone in the room right now, what we're doing is we're gonna take two, you don't have to stand up. You can sit down. It's actually kind of nicer to sit down. I'm standing up because I'm standing up. Um, yeah, it's nicer to sit down. So no matter what you're doing right now, let's just dedicate the next two minutes to this exercise. Then we're going to get right back into the talk and we're going to talk about underdogs and stuff. Um, so let's feel, let's close our eyes. If you feel comfortable closing your eyes, let's, let's close our eyes. And if you're sitting down, that's great. If you're standing up, that doesn't matter. That's, that's cool too. And we're going to start to feel heavy. We're gonna just, for a moment, kind of recognize that although we feel like we're just kind of standing here or sitting here, actually we're in bodies and these bodies have weight. Actually, we are hurtling through space thousands of kilometers per hour. And what is holding us here to the surface of this earth is actually this mysterious force called gravity. Gravity is literally hugging us down to the surface of the earth. That is a force that is pulling us down. So let's just allow our body to relax into this force of gravity. Allow the forehead to relax and to sink down. Allow the jaw to relax. Allow the muscles and the tendons, allow the bones to descend further towards the ground. Allow ourselves to feel this sense of heaviness and stability, connection almost as if there are roots shooting out underneath us and connecting us to Mother Earth. And then with one hand, place it on your heart. So the heart center right in the middle of your chest. And slowly tune in to how the heart feels on the hand. Not how we think it feels, but how does that point of contact actually feel? Can we tune into that rhythm? I mean, first of all, I think it's important to remember that we have a heart. And once we've remembered that, just tuning into how the heart actually feels on the hand. This rhythm that's running through our whole lives. And as we tune in to this pulsating rhythm, this drumbeat, that's kind of the soundtrack of our lives, allowing some appreciation to bubble up. This, this miraculous organ, which is beating 100,000 times a day. Even if we have aches and pains, this thing is keeping us alive and really deeply feeling as much as we can. Thank you. Thank you. We can even say that mentally. Thank you, my heart and sort of envisioning this appreciation as almost a ball of light around the heart. Allowing this ball of light to expand a little bit more to include the whole body. Thank you, my body, really deeply feeling that, thank you. And allowing that bubble of appreciation to get a bit bigger to fill the whole room that you're in. You know, thank you for this time and this space and then outside into your neighborhood, your community, like thank you for this community. And then out to the whole world, everywhere, all beings, thank you. And putting both palms together in front of the heart center. A gentle bow, and when we bow, we're not bowing to a god or a guru, we're just bowing to our hearts and promising to take care of them. Thanks all. And that, that state change that I hope you felt, that I just felt right now, that state change is, is available whenever we remember that we have a heart, whenever we remember that we're breathing, whenever we, we remember that we're in this body feeling these emotions. That song 
brothers that Desiree sang. It's, it's an encouragement to be in the body, to be right here. And I think that, that that practice of learning to love our own hearts is really kind of the key to letting go of the underdog mentality. I'm going to get back to that in a second, but I think that learning how to turn on and off the tap, because that's effectively what spiritual practice is, is learning to turn on and off the tap of creativity at will. Like when we open the heart, we open creativity. And if we do this practice, that's why it's called practice, because you're literally practicing opening every morning. We just did a two-minute thing, but you know, there's so many ways that, that we can do this. And I think that if I look at how that served me, taking this creative passion, and this creative passion can be anything, doesn't have to be music, and marrying it with the purpose that comes from, you know, being able to sort of control it a little bit, has allowed me not only to have a career in music for the last 15 years or so playing uh, something like 2,000 shows all over the world, it's also allowed me to creatively transition that into now being the executive director of 5X Festival, which is the largest South Asian youth event in Canada. We're in the middle of this big pivot uh, right now because we can't do our normal 10 or 15,000 person parties. So we're working with a tech company in India um, to build an app basically that allows, you know, inside the app we've built 40 stages and over the course of a couple months people move between the stages in the app unlocking content via a combination of like physical stepping that's connected to your step counter uh, or meditating or doing yoga or whatever and creative engagement. Um, so this is called Race to the Stage, and we launch it in about a week from now. Uh, my record label, Snakes and Ladders, which is devoted to, you know, giving voice to unheard South Asian artists, is doing a festival in a video game next weekend. It's, it's like a video game called Minecraft for all of you who have kids. So we've actually built a stage in this, the biggest digital festival that's ever happened. And I think that, you know, creativity doesn't have to be writing songs, although writing songs is amazing. It can also be how we're creatively responding to certain situations. Um, and I think especially if we have a way to turn this on and off for it to be there when we need it, I think it makes it very powerful. It's a very powerful tool for change um, because a lot of the work that I'm doing is yes, it's fun and it's music and stuff, but it's also there's this kind of through line of advocacy of, of expressing support and providing platforms for the underdogs. And so let's come back to this idea of underdog. Now, I grew up thinking, uh, for, for reasons that I've already expressed, I grew up thinking about myself as an underdog. And I think that, you know, in many ways that serves us. In many ways, um, it's actually been shown, you know, in studies, in scientific studies, that if you think of yourself as an underdog, you're going to do better because it's going to force you to work harder. Um, or it's going to inspire you, you know, to, to do that thing, to grab that thing. And, and I think, you know, we underdogs, because that's the other curious thing, that has been found is that everyone thinks they're an underdog, literally. Like you could have the richest white dude in the world in his castle, he still thinks he's an underdog. This has been shown. It's, a, it's almost like a structure that's built into our heads. Like it's, and if we, start to, if we start to look out, if we start to pan out and look around, we can see that that structure is all around us. This idea of underdog and top dog. Malcolm Gladwell has written a book about it. You know, David and Goliath. Uh, there's, there's Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. In some way, it's the story of this like unexpected, you know, person who starts a journey. The Lord of the Rings is about that. From, from you know, the, we have the most dangerous game, uh, like from back in the day, or Running Man in the 80s, where you have these underdog personalities, you know, or even the Hunger Games. Like against all odds, you know, this person persevered. And there's something intoxicating about it. But I think there's also a big problem with this because, you know, essentially it's, it's almost like this perverted version of the American dream that says that everyone has a chance. And although technically that's true, actually, if you're a black person growing up in North America, you have much less of a chance. And so there's this false equivalence that's made you know, which is kind of like seductive. It's like everyone can do it. Everyone can like make their way out of their situation. But really, the game is rigged. And I think one of the most beautiful things that we see coming out of this moment in history is that that is becoming clear. The veil is dropping. Um, I, think, I think the time has come to own up and to recognize um, that 
that things are not even. And talking about buying into this underdog, top dog thing is actually destructive because what's, what we're trying to do right now is not displace the top dogs and, and give room for the underdog to like get to the top dogs. We're trying to dismantle the whole system. This whole system of privilege is not useful. Uh, it's, it's not helpful. And I think now that I hope we can all see it, the time has come to actually put into place real actions towards dismantling this destructive system. And so I would, I would venture to say, I guess my argument, my hypothesis is that this is no longer a useful way of thinking. So something that's happening for my organization right now is uh, a few weeks ago, um, we noticed my organization, 5X Festival, we work in Surrey. And Surrey, for those of you who don't know, has the largest black population in British Columbia. It also has the largest urban indigenous population in British Columbia. It is also 60% BIPOC, so 60, or, you know, only 40% white. Um, and yet their decision makers, the mayor and council, are seven out of nine of them are white. Uh, and the executive leadership, eight out of 11 of them are white. And we noticed a few weeks ago that they hadn't posted anything. We're in the middle of the biggest civil rights movement of our generation, and these folks had not posted anything. And we were like, hey, guys, you know, what's up? So we started writing letters, no answer. We started posting on socials. They put up some, you know, vague statement about, like, racism being bad. We started pressing more and more. We garnered 5,000 signatures on a petition, no answer. Just mums the word. Um, and then all of a sudden, I reached out to some artists who were on a bill, Canada Day, this online Canada Day show. Uh, and... And these artists were like, wait, that's messed up. We don't want to like go play for a show in a city that's not supporting its black and brown population. That doesn't make any sense. So they pulled out uh, eight of them, Mother Mother, Said the Whale, Daniel Wesley, uh, The Beaches. They all just pulled out. And this, this big sort of online Canada Day thing that Surrey was doing, um, you know, I think they still managed to pull it off to some degree, <clears throat> but they started listening. And they started phoning us back and they started answering their emails. And I don't want to say that we're there yet because I think it's going to take a lot of work. And I encourage you all to, you know, maybe someone can throw a link to the petition uh, up in the chat right now. I encourage you to please spread this because this is really important. Um, this is really important that there's a city. Uh, I, I believe, Desiree, you're from Surrey. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a city that's just straight up not listening to its black and brown population. So for me, this is super, you know, super frustrating. Um, but the amazing thing is that it was artists who decided to take their art and marry it with purpose and they created instant action that got press all over the province because they were like, this doesn't make sense. And so I think what is encouraging about this is, again, showing that us as creatives, we actually have power. And if we... You know, I think for a while, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, again, be really straight with you here and, and speak as honestly as I can. I think until very recently, I was willing to give people a pass, white people. And so I'm going to take the white half of myself here and speak to you, white person to white person. I was willing to cut you a break. I was willing to um, be like, oh, you know, this person just doesn't understand. Like this person just hasn't spent the time. But we are in the midst of a moment right now. And I am right now revoking your passes. You don't get a pass anymore. If you are not, if you're a creative person and you're actively engaging with your heart, you're actively doing this heart work, right? You're doing all of your practices and stuff and you are not actively engaged with dismantling racism, uh, dismantling anti-black and anti-indigenous racism right now in your life. If you're not doing that, then you are not doing your duty as a human being. Creativity does not stand apart from action. If you are paralyzed or silent, then you're not doing enough. If, you're, if you are feeling guilty or shameful, those are the signs that you're not doing enough. If you are, if you are silent, you are complicit. If you are silent, that's actually an action. It's a decision to be silent and you are complicit. And so if you are one of those folks, if you're a white folk and you are like biking around, you know, on the weekend on your fixie and you're like picking up coffee and you're like going to get your micro brewery thing and you're kind of clueless, you're like, well, I kind of know something's happening in the States, but I'm not really, you know, oh, geez, we've got to like take our fixie bike around this like protest that's happening up front. Wake the fuck up. 
That is my message to you. Um, because in 20 years from now, your kids are going to be like, you know, dad, what were you doing during this time? Or mom, what were you doing during this time? Like, were you a part of it? Were you out on the protest? Like, what were you doing? Just like I asked my dad who, you know, he went, he was in North America in 1969. And I'm like, dad, where were you? You know, were you like fighting with the Black Panthers? What were you doing? And he's like, uh, I, was, I was doing my homework, you know, cause he was, he was working. He was, and, and I was like, what, seriously? You didn't go to any parties? Like the summer of love, you didn't do any of it? You didn't even smoke a joint? Dad, I love you, but you should have at least smoked a joint in 1969, come on, don't be that guy. Don't be that guy who in, in you know, 20 years from now has to tell his kids that he just sort of sat on the sidelines and watched this stuff happen. Be a part of it. Like this is, this is here, it's, it's, I'm gonna again appeal to you as a half white person, it's our job. It's not the job of people of color, it's not the job of BIPOC people. We are the ones that built this shit, we are the ones that have to dismantle it. So let's together, scratch this top dog, underdog thing that we've built, get rid of it. Let's tap into our creativity, tap into our hearts. A daily practice is an amazing way to do that. And when you marry creativity with action that has sort of purpose behind it, we can really take this place and make it more equitable for all. That is my appeal. Thank you so much. There's an audience. <laughs> oh, perfect. So for those of you who just rejoined us now, um, what we're doing now is we're opening up the space for questions and answers. Um, so if you have any of them, please put them in the chat and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Thank you. Oh, oh sorry. Casey, give it a go. Okay, so do all of you live in Surrey? Uh, we, can't we can't hear you that well, but I work in Surrey and Desiree is from Surrey. I live in Richmond. Okay, we're, um, yeah, I, I'm from Richmond originally. Um, where do you guys see Surrey in five years in terms of, of um, creating, you know what it is? It's, it's like seeing everybody as a human being, as I, as I said earlier in the chat, rather than seeing someone as less than because of something. Um, do you see Surrey changing within five years? And, and Richmond as well. Richmond's even worse, I think. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll just answer uh, quickly and then throw to Desiree because Desiree is actually from there. Um, Surrey's going to be the biggest city in British Columbia very soon. Uh, it's extremely diverse. It's super young. And uh, I think, you know, it's in this transition of moving between like a small town and an actual real city. And there's still a lot of the power brokers in the city um, who, have, who have not made that transition mentally. They're still sort of trying to keep it a small little city. So, you know, I think they're going to grow up. And, uh, and I really look forward to it because it is, I'm not joking, it's my favorite city in British Columbia, which is why I'm working so hard to, to, to try to get them to, to grow up. Uh, Desiree? Your experiences? Yeah, I don't know how, I don't really have much to say about where it will be in five years. I have no clue. Um, I have the same hopes as you that <laughs> we will all grow and um, and I, it is also my favorite city and I love Surrey and um, so I, my hopes are that things get a lot better and that people start waking up but I um, and that's what I'll continue to kind of root for and work towards and I can do that like personally within myself and then how I share in the communities, but that's kind of um, all I can do. And not really, I don't know what's gonna happen pretty much is my answer. <laughs> yeah, go for the best. <laughs> Somebody asked if what your thoughts are, I guess, Tara, um, on the new situation with the police department. Will that, is that an opportunity? Is that a danger? What do you see that fitting in? How do you see that fitting in? I think strategically at the moment, just my position, I'm going to avoid saying anything about that and sort of steer that's a really hot button topic. Um, and what I think personally about it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, but I think it's, that's definitely related to the kind of response that we're seeing for sure. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot mixed up in that, you know, transition of the police department. And I think the other thing that's possibly scary 
for the city at the moment is that so much of Black Lives Matter um, and so much of this current movement that's happening is tied to the defunding of the police. And so I think that's why certain authorities are steering clear. Of the, they're just like, let's not talk about this at all because maybe the whole thing will go away. But, but I think you know, this time it's not going away. And so I think we should be transparently having these conversations and not trying to ignore them. I do see the question about universities. Um, so one of the questions is, what about the universities in Surrey? Um, their role in Surrey, there's, so there's two main ones, SFU and Kwantlen, or KPU, and I am an alumni of both. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess, um, so yeah, so my, my thoughts, um, I, from being in the background at SFU, I see a lot of the good that they're doing. Um, I see like Steve Dooley, who's the executive director at SFU, uh, Surrey, um, and I see how he's really trying to be embedded in the community. Um, and you know, so there's a lot of work around like the Surrey Poverty Reduction Coalition, um, and I feel that those institutions, um, SFU, in particular because I'm more involved with it now, um, are trying to make more active um, moves and trying to be more community engaged. Um, and so I think they play a particularly important role, and I think uh, it's an, it's it's advantageous for Surrey as a city to have institutions or spaces um, that are really a space for like young people like ourselves. Um, to have a different perspective and to be able to like challenge the status quo. So I think that answered the question. Yeah, and I, I would say I see a lot of comments here in the chat. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, Rochelle, let's let's uh, get to that in a second. I just want to try to steer clear because my appeal here and my appeal in the presentation and even this petition that we're doing in Surrey is not about defunding the police. It's not about anything radical. It's about getting Surrey to say that systemic racism exists and that we're going to do something about it. Those are non-negotiable things. These are not things that we can like think, oh, well, that's a radical idea. It's not a radical idea. The RCMP just did that. You know, we can do that in Surrey as well. And so everything else comes after that. Let's not get into, let's not sort of get sidetracked with other discussions about, you know, anything. Let's, let's focus on the acknowledging that systemic racism exists because until we do that, we, we can't do anything else. Uh, it looks like there's a question here from Rochelle Desiree. I also noticed something too about someone saying like, we need the good guys to take, make sure we're safe. But I think that's going back to that is for you, someone might be a good guy, but to me, that same person isn't a good guy for me because that same person sees me as a threat, sees me as not going to treat me as a human. So I think that's a big thing that we need to sit with is that what you think is a system of good guys is not for many people. And that's going back to just the, the simple acknowledgement. Racism is here. Anti-black racism is here. It exists and like to just sit with that is, is something, not just sit with it, but sit with it so you can understand it and then we, we take action and then you start to, things start to shift. So yeah, the good guys thing, I was like, ah, that doesn't feel so right for me. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel you. Yeah. Uh, Mark, can you scroll down to Rochelle's comment? Do you have any thoughts about that one, Desiree? Yeah, okay, so centering whiteness in the midst of movement. And you know what, Rochelle, like, I think for me this is something I struggle with because it feels like I've constantly been the voice of color in a sea of white. So it's almost like I'm still learning how to even not just speak to whiteness. Like it's, so it's definitely something I'm like, and it's, it's a big process for me because I still like when I look out at who's at my shows and I'm like, okay, I have to, I have to cater this into a certain way. I have to speak in a certain way. I have to, I have to uh, make sure that I'm not coming off as too angry. You know what I mean? And I know I don't need to say this to you, but I, I actually would love to discuss this more because I actually am not sure because I'm still coming out of my uh, survival mode of, of having to cater to whiteness. So I think, I, I'm actually, I would love to figure out <laughs> how to do that, and especially in spaces like this. And in, I don't know who's all in the chat, um, but uh, the space here, there's lots of whiteness. <laughs> like it's, it's kind of, it's... The, the color's here pretty much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's a great, I don't know if either of you have want to add to that, but I'm definitely in that process myself. Well, I feel like, Rochelle, if you can come on the screen, can we do that? Mm. And it sounds like you have some thoughts. I'd love to, love to hear your thoughts about it. Uh, see if we can find you. It might be echoey. Perfect. Hey. Hi. Oh, can we Thank you all for your time? thoughts oh, and wait, for being just, here today. We're just unmuting you. Sorry. Oh. 
Try now. Am I unmuted? Yes. Mm -hmm. And thank you all for your thoughts and your contributions, creatively and otherwise. Um, it, it's, um, I'm here in San Francisco in California, so um, it's nice to see some Canadian fellow creatives. Um, uh, my question is really just something that I'm grappling with. Um, I'm a biracial person. Um, raised by a single white mother who never in my entire life talked to me about race. Um, that was great. Um, <clears throat> but, but the kind of undercurrent of the takeaway that came from that is that I had to figure it out and I am very, very good at keeping white people comfortable. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> um, <clears throat> that's a survival strategy and in this time, um, when we're actually having it as a specific conversation uh, with white people being involved in that. Um, like the hopeful part of me, the heart part of me wanted to be like, great, like we can make some progress in this. But what I uh, quickly ran into is that it's even more treacherous than ever. <laughs> um, and even more fraught to discuss than ever. Um, and I kind of got the, the um, filter of invisibility taken away from me. So um, I, I don't really, I, I mean, I, I truly asked that question as a question, like do you, if anybody had any thoughts on that. Um, and I, I wish that I had like clearer answers or, uh, you know, you know, points one through three of a checklist of things to do to, um, to, to actually help myself and help the people that I'm talking to, whether they are people who I know or people who are strangers to me, um, have a productive and, um, and um, equitable conversation that actually moves us forward. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that, that's all I got. Thanks, Rochelle. Uh, okay, we're good. Um, so one, one thing that comes to mind right away is uh, Marlon James uh, said in an article, I think it was like three years ago, um, called like I think it was called like I'm done with diversity panels, uh, and his the essence of his point was like I think this is the time for white people to wake up, and so there's there's like in some weird way there is sort of a centering around whiteness because it's actually like white people are realizing right now that there's a lot of work to do for for many many of them are realizing that for the first time, and Marlon James's point in this article was that it's white people that have to be on diversity panels. Like when they call in a bunch of like people of color to diversity panels, it's kind of besides the point because we already have PhDs in this shit, you know? Like we've already been talking about this stuff for our whole lives. Like when I see somebody in the, in the chat saying, I can't wait till we get to a point beyond white or black. Well, we've never been beyond that point because we've been talking about race for our whole lives. And for white people who are feeling uncomfortable right now, it's because this is a concept that's being introduced to you now. But we've all, like I've been dealing this, with this for 45 years. Mm -hmm. You know, like this is like literally when I'm hanging out with my brown friends, this is what we talk about. Um, and so this is not something that you get to ignore. This is something that you're waking up to now and we have to take it seriously. And I think Marlon James's point about like, you know, it's, it's like the white people that have to be on the panels doing the work, not the people of color talking about how important diversity is. We already know that. Uh, so, so I think that in some weird way, like, you know, white, white folks have to get together and talk about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so we'll do one more question. Um, is there one that we that comes oh, to? I asked this one. Okay, cool. Let's yeah, we can read that one. So, as musicians, does this challenging period of time, in brackets, on many levels, inspire you to write new original work? Or does it inspire creativity for you? So, musicians. Um. Well, yes. In some ways, I felt creative. In other ways, I felt just like. Oh no, I can't do this anymore. So I go through waves. It's totally a waves thing for me. Um, and I've been writing a lot. I've been finding I've been writing a lot, but not necessarily putting it into like a song, but I'm just writing all day long, writing down ideas, writing songs, writing bits, 
Um, but I'm having a hard time getting like the fuel to continue it and like take it to the studio or start like getting out my gear and stuff. And I think there's so much grief happening for me right now that it's hard to actually want to do anything, but to get it out feels good. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of just moving through a lot of, of grief. So it's definitely challenging, but it's, it comes up and it's helpful. Like you were saying too, the creativity ends up, um, being helpful to me. Like it's when I let it be coming from a really like true place, it's, it's healing, it's medicine. So, um, it doesn't look a certain way all the time. Like it's not like, and here's a song and now I can put it out and release it. It's just like, it, I'm constantly creating. So yes, that's my, my answer. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, very quickly, yeah, I mean, I've gotten really into, weirdly, I've gotten into uh, ambient music because I feel that's what I need. And so I've been using, for any of you who saw this, the, the thing last month, I've, I've been into this like weird spaceship looking machine which uses control voltages to make sound according to certain logical rules. Sounds complicated, but it's really actually quite beautiful. So that's, that's where I'm at because it's sort of soothing me mm -hmm. right now. Perfect. This song's called Hey Brother. I wrote this song because I have uh, six siblings, I'm the eldest. And uh, growing up, well, I wrote this song maybe four years ago, five years ago, as I was just kind of feeling really angry and really upset and really just kind of lost and feeling like, wow, life is really unfair. And I, watching my siblings grow up, in a world where we didn't see ourselves represented, and when we did, we saw ourselves represented as villains, as comedic relief, as just nothing positive. And realizing that that's not just like, oh, well you saw it on TV, get over it. It's like, that's what we, that was embedded now in our worthiness as human beings on this planet. So as young black and brown humans, we thought we weren't worthy. And now as adults, we're doing all this unraveling to remember that we are. So this song was dedicated to my brothers, in the moment, I was specifically thinking of my brothers, but also it's for my sisters. It's also for my family who is, we're not blood related, but just anyone out there who's had the experience of um, not seeing themselves represented in the light that they should have. Um, and I'm excited that now we are, I mean, I think for a long time, there's been movements of people trying to fight against that. And I feel um, grateful that I feel so supported in stepping into my worthiness and knowing who I am and encouraging others to do the same. Also, for a note for my brothers was, um, you don't always have to be like um, strong. Whatever strong has has looked like, being soft, crying, being connected with your emotions is not a weakness. It's actually one of the most powerful strengths. Tell me, brother. Can I feel your heart? Tell me, brother, can we start people high up? Our planning and things, see the sun in your smiles, they try to clip your wings. Tell me, brother, can you apply to acknowledge your dreams? It's your turn to fly. Tell me, brother, can you apply to acknowledge your dreams? It's your turn. Hey, my brother, why you let them help you kill each other? We should come together and race in color. We should come together work through the struggle. Hey, my brother, can't you see they're pitting us against each other? We should come together and race in color. We should come together work through the struggle. Caught up in the mind games, we live in a trap Forced to believe that there's no going back To a time when we were strong Our hearts tell the stories, reaching through the pain And searching for glory Rip open the wounds, unsever all the knots Undo all the ties that are serving and not I see you, my brother I hold you, my sis, big up one another. Don't bask in the tricks that society has told us. Always trying to mold us. Never light enough, but then 
eyes so light that they can hold us. Hold us behind bars or bar up my mind. I'm speaking my truth cause this is the time. This is the time. Hey, my brother. Hey, hey, my brother. 